Hi, and welcome to Ask Clever Over Coffee, How AI Built This. I am your co-host this week, John Marino, and I am with ChatGBT, voiced by Billy Darkenwald. Hi there. Hey, how you doing? Good, great. And today we have a very special guest in studio, Chris McDuffie. Hello, thanks for having me. You bet, you bet. Thanks for being here. So one of the reasons that we really wanted to talk about AI in video production, and you're our first guest, uh, and so we're super excited because there's so much to cover. And of course, we were chatting before the show, and, and, then, and then I was like thinking of like five more questions. I was like, wait a minute, I got to stop talking to you because we got to save it for the show. But why don't we just start in the beginning, which is tell us a little bit more about your background of yourself and how did you get into video production and just like bring people up to speed a little bit. Right on. So uh, born and raised in Twin Cities. Uh, I've been a lifelong creative, drawing, painting, working with clay, stop motion animation, claymation as a kid. I was a band nerd. In college, <laughs> I, I did custom sneakers that I had to take pictures of, which got me into photography. Okay. I uh, started business shortly after college, started in nightlife where I met a lot of amazing, fantastic people and built up a client list. Um, COVID was kind of a big pivot from stills into doing video. Okay. I uh, saw a lot of opportunity, you know, moving into motion. Um, obviously, I, you know, had some equipment and a little bit of experience. Uh, COVID provided me with the time to upskill. You know, there's a lot of YouTube University and like what kind of tools can I utilize to get from where my stills, you know, skills were into motion. Um, I'd say, you know, mostly now a lot of the work that I do is is video production. Okay. Yeah. And so how many years would you say you've been doing this? The business has been 14 years. 14 years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which is similar to myself where I've been in marketing now for 14 years. Mm. And, but in AI, I started in AI uh, a year ago. How long have you been using AI in video production? Mm, seriously, maybe the past six months. Okay. I, I would say probably the past two years has is, is been my involvement in generative AI. Got it, yeah. got it. Because when we were talking pre-show, uh, we were both discussing and agreeing with that a year ago, neither one of us would be sitting down having this conversation because it would just be too new. Uh, the AI shift into the workplace in different industries has really happened over the last 12 months. And the whole purpose of this podcast is to bring people who are using AI, talk about it, how is it working? Because one of the biggest fears that I've always had and still get, even from conversations this weekend, is that AI is going to replace jobs. And then, of course, there's another group of people that believe that people who learn AI are the ones that are going to have the jobs, not just nobody's going to have a job. So, you know, what would you say are some of the most significant AI tools that you're using right now in your production company? Yeah, it's still really early and a lot of them are crude. I would say ChatGPT has been fantastic for uh, copy, for hashing out ideas, for marketing plans, stuff like that. Sure. Um, more specifically to video production, a, a lot of the platforms now are incorporating AI into what they're doing. So I, I'll probably have to speak a little bit back and forth between stills and motion because you know I'm, I'm involved in both worlds and using tools in both. But you know, Photoshop has a lot of generative tools uh, in, in their suite of, of software. Um, I use DaVinci Resolve a lot for video editing. Okay. One of the coolest tools that I've been using is the voice isolation. So it could be in a really noisy environment and like you flick a switch and it sounds like it's studio quality, which, you know, I do a lot of uh, corporate testimonials and smaller stories of that nature, small, small crews. And the conditions to film aren't always or often ideal. In really noisy environments. It's like wherever we can set up in a corner, that's that's what we have just to, to tell the story. Uh, so having that option has been a lifesaver in a lot of instances. Well, good, because we're going to put a lot of your skills to the test. Oh, man. <laughs> we have ChatGPT in-house, oh, in man. studio, right. and we're going to go back and forth, give some different scenarios. This is going to be a much different format. If you guys have been uh, watching us on previous episodes on YouTube or listening on Spotify or any of the other uh, podcast platforms, we are switching things up this week. You know, So this is episode 10 for us. Woohoo! That's just me. Woo -woo. Yeah, we're 
<laughs> kind of excited that we hit this milestone. We're 10 into it. We're learning a few things. We're changing a few things. And one of the things that we've gotten a lot of uh, viewer feedback is to make the flow and change it up. And so we're starting at the top of our show with the Fast Five with AI. AI and ChatGPT does this fun little segment asking questions, rapid fire questions. You give like, we always tell our guests, just give like one word answers. And of course, nobody follows the rules. <laughs> but um, you, it's, a, it's a way to get to know the guests. And now we're moving this to the top of the show. So do, uh, Billy, when you're ready. Yep, yeah, here we go. Uh, first question, coffee or tea? I know it's a tough one. T. T. Okay. Second is best editing software. Photoshop. Okay. Uh, third is AI or human editors. Human editors. Human. I agree. How about favorite movie director? Spike Lee, Christopher Nolan. Ooh, that's good. Last one is go to AI tool. Eleven Labs. Oh. What is Eleven Labs? So it's a voice. AI software. Okay. Uh, it, it's extremely versatile as far as there's a whole library of voices that you can use. Um, but the really cool thing is being able to train voices. I've been doing that more and more clients. So according to the white papers, you need, I think it's like three one minute samples of someone's voice. Otherwise, if it's anything longer, the, the model breaks down. Mm -hmm. But it sounds just like whoever's voice you're training it on. So for a lot of projects where you know, time, location, for whatever reason, I can't sit down with somebody in person like this, just to have them send me little samples of their voice. And then again, using ChatGPT for copy, throw it in 11 labs and there's their voice. It's kind of been a game changer. That's awesome. Yeah. So what's interesting about that is that, you know, oftentimes when you're doing the editing and post-production and then you come to a scene and you're like, man, it would be really great if we did a reshoot with the actors and we wanted them to say this, or we want to say that. But now what you're saying is that you could take the voice of one of whoever you're working on on the project and put it into 11 labs, write the script the way you want it, the what you really want them to say, and then use that as voiceover with maybe some B-roll. I've seen AI tools, and again, a lot of this is experimental, but I've seen some that take that a step further to where it'll redub people's mouths. So the samples that I've seen, it'll do it in different languages. Like you have an actor that's speaking in French and then German and then Italian and then Mandarin or whatever. So I, again, I don't know how many of these are off the shelf tools versus a lot of stuff is just in you know labs where you've got you know, data scientists or machine learning scientists or whatever they're experimenting sure. with. But there's some like really advanced stuff that's that's kind of already out in the ether. Sure. Yeah. And what's interesting, you know, in filmmaking, video production, is that filmmakers have always been at the forefront of technology, mm -hmm. and they've always given us this illusion of what they want you to see. But it, it's really not there, right? I mean, all the way back to like Star Wars, where like they were literally painting the the sets mm -hmm. and, and what have you to give the illusion that you had all these actors and it was this huge scene to all the green screens that we see and all the CGI that we see in movies. What would you say? What's your thought on like what's different about what AI is bringing to the table from video production versus CGI. Yeah, I, I think the big thing uh, with AI, it's it's the, the three production factors, uh, quality, cost, and time, and it's kind of making those three factors really efficient. So what would have taken huge teams a long period of time and really expensive is kind of paring down that entire process. Wow. Yeah. So that means people who are working on commercial work, like, you know, for different companies for TV commercials or, or even social content, they're the ones that are really benefiting the most from this, these different advances. I think everyone is, but I, I personally just, you know, kind of being one man band, small crew, I'm really excited for, uh, increasing the production value of what I do for clients okay. projects where like, it's not cost effective for a lot of my clients to have a team of 20 people and have months to yeah. execute on something. But if it's something that me and a couple other people can do in a much shorter length of time, like that's really exciting. 
Yeah, yeah. And what I've noticed even in marketing for what we're doing on our side, we we've noticed that it just takes a lot less people to produce the same content or the same amount of work that we were doing a few years ago. And that's just becoming more efficient in the process. Um, when we're creating video content, we're using a lot more AI tools. The one that I've been using and I'll share with the audience is captions and they haven't paid me. I'm not endorsed by them or anything like that, but it's a, an app on the iPhone and the app store. And it's been a great um, tool that we've been using. And what's interesting is, so like, I can just upload a video of myself, a one minute video, and to going back to your point earlier, that you, you would be able to then write the script and then whatever you want me to be saying, it can do that and then it can throw B-roll behind it. So you could produce a whole thing by just getting a one minute video of, of a client or a spokesperson or whoever you want and then throw it in there and it does all the rest, yeah. which is fascinating. What, it, what, what has been the pushback from either actors that you've worked with or um, any sort of artists on is there pushback? Because I know with the writer strike and what have you, that was a big uh, piece of the, the whole negotiation agreement was about AI and, and using like uh, sounding uh, people and all their likeness and not, and you know, cause the actors are worried that they're gonna be replaced. Have you seen that from the people that you're working with or what, what is uh, what the feedback there? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think we, you know, for a lot of the, the folks that I've been working with, uh, a huge, issue in addition to you know obviously folks livelihood uh, it's just legal and like how legally are we able to use these things and implement them without getting sued essentially or having this blowback on us um i, I there's a lot of lawsuits out there i i'm sure it'll take a long time before it gets settled but uh just the the legal ramifications is a huge issue and do you think that the way to overcome that the, the short answer would be just to license everybody so you you pay people, for example, let's say you have 10 different actors, or all these different character actors, or 10 different musicians, and then you pay them up front, and you say, hey, we're gonna use this, and then we're gonna take bits and pieces and use your life, but you're, we're paying you to use it. I mean, isn't that the best the way that actors to get paid is say, hey, you wanna use my voice, or you wanna use my image, just pay me you know, a royalty or yeah. essentially. Yeah, I, you know, I think because it's so new, everyone's trying to figure out what the, the most ethical way to move forward. And that's certainly a way that I've seen a lot of people um, utilize. I, I think that's a good, a good starting place. Um, there's a director here locally I heard speak and essentially they would license people's images or, mm -hmm. or voices for a length of time. Right. I think Eleven Labs does the same thing. So okay. voice actors that um, maybe want a little additional income, they'll license their voice to Eleven Labs for a year, and then after that year, the contract is up and they can renew it or decide to, to walk away from it. Um, it it's so new, we're, we're trying to figure out what's the best way to move forward with this, you know? Now, is there a little bit of irony that um, some people are using AI to write the legal contracts, <laughs> the, the legal work. Is there some irony in that? <laughs> Absolutely. I saw that that headline. It was like a I don't know if it was a senator in Arkansas that used ChatGPT to write some le some piece of legislation on something that had to do with AI or technology. It's like, yeah, yeah I, I get it. It makes things a lot easier, but it kind of defeats the purpose. It, it really does, and it loses the the point of the the voice and the tone of whoever the original person is. So I was speaking with a politician earlier today and they were talking about using AI for different parts of the government and, and their responsibilities. And the woman I was talking to, she does not use ChatGPT or any AI tools to write her speeches. And she was like, I just wanna keep, you know, what I'm doing internal and I do not want AI to replace my tone because the words I choose and what I do is important. So it is interesting that uh, certain uh, people are using it and it's, you know, almost kind of replacing it like in, in different bills and what have you and legal work. But um, it, it, I think that it has to be figured out because do you think one of the biggest challenges right now is just having full disclosure 
of like, when is AI being used and when is it um, not being used? Like, so for example, like content on social media or in, in Netflix or in what have you, do you, do you think, like how far do you think uh, you need to disclose up front what you're watching, whether it's generated by AI or? I think that would be great. I, when I think about um, in the photography industry, I think it was France a couple of years ago that wanted to label any ads that had been uh, messed with as far as photoshopped. They wanted to put like a label on an ad that said, this has been photoshopped in some way. I think it's a good idea. You know, I think their hearts and minds are in the right place. I don't know if that would materially affect people's consumption. I mean, most people, this is it. Like, this is how right. they interface with the world. Right, right, right. Like, an ad that says this has been AI, it's like, okay, cool, but you know, are people are going to pay attention to that. I think it's a good start. I think it's a good, you know, conversation starting point. So I've created some content for different clients, and I used an AI person, like a spokesperson, and then I would post it, and I noticed, like, on TikTok and Instagram, the reach dramatically reduced if you said that you were using AI versus if I use original content and do it how I've always been doing it uh, without AI, just like doing video editing and what have you. Um, then, you know, the, you know, everything's normal and what have you. But I did notice that on both platforms, TikTok and Instagram, they really throttle back if you're using AI to create content being uh explicit about it or well both yeah because you, you know you have to um label it if you're using it sure. you have to hit the button well again that that's kind of what you're getting to before it's like at what point do you know what you're consuming has been generated or edited with ai i think it's getting increasingly difficult to tell whether something's ai or not um there were some companies not too long ago that i think they created a a system where Say, for instance, a professor could upload their students' papers to see if it had been, you know, written with ChatGPT. Right. And, like, I think the failure rate was really high. It wasn't good. Sure. There's not a good way to tell if something has been generated with AI. Um, I think it's really difficult with copy because uh, this scrapes the best of everything off the Internet and, you know, images and video and voice. It's all catching up to how good ChatGPT is. Sure. I, I feel like, for me, the gray line is when we talk about Photoshop, you know, a lot of influencers use Photoshop to either put themselves into background scenery that, you know, they're not there or, hey, I'm on a private jet or I'm in this car or whatever, you know, there's a lot of trickery and foolery and that's been going on for a long time. I mean, that's, that's kind of the business, right? Um, versus AI can take an image of a person and recreate that whole scene altogether too. It could put you in a, an airplane or, you know, a beautiful uh, beach or something like that. And as somebody who consumes media, I mean, how much really matters? Like, I mean, I mean, cause I mean, people have been using Photoshop for a long time. There used to be a website called, it might still be up. Uh, it was something like Photoshop fails. And it was just a collection oh, okay. of like f back in the day, people giving extra limbs on Kardashians or stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, like right. All the, the Photoshop <laughs> fails in, in the ad world. Sure. And I'm like, there's not a huge difference between that and what AI is producing with right. like extra fingers or weird limbs or stuff like that. Right. Know. And what does it matter? Like, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, do you want your influencer or the brand to tell you up front that, well, we used a combination of CGI, AI, and, you know, our production team to come up with this concept to bring this to you for entertainment? I mean, at the end of the time, at the end of the day, it's just entertainment, right? Yeah, I think for a lot of fields like entertainment, you know, it, it probably doesn't matter so much. If it gets into medical or politics or other areas, I, I kind of want there to be more disclosure and people being transparent and to know where the, the source of information is coming from. <clears throat> okay. Yes, ChatGPT. Yeah, so as AI advances in production, how do you maintain the balance between using AI and keeping key in-person roles? What standards, guides do you have preserving the 
basic human element? That's kind of a long question. But. No, that's a good question. It's one that I don't, I don't know if we've figured out yet. I, I personally have been using it to superpower my processes and who I am. And it's not so much this as a tool of replacement as just a tool to help people be better at whatever they're doing. Mm-hmm. How that scales industry-wide, I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know that we'll, we'll have that figured out anytime soon. Do you feel it's cheating if you're using AI to write a screenplay versus doing it yourself? Um, I've seen people put together shorts that are written by ChatGPT just as a test. Mm-hmm. Ten minutes short, this was written by ChatGPT, here it is. Um, I think, back to kind of what we talked about before recording, I, I think the artist will always have a place. Mm-hmm. I think people that are really adept at copywriting, script writing, they're going to use it to, to be super powered. And obviously you can use it just chat GPT, write me a Oscar winning script probably won't be all that great or compelling. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of humanity that's probably going to be lacking, but um, I, I think that there's room for a lot of folks, folks that are just going to use it as a, a, a dull tool and let the AI do all the work. And a lot of people that can, do prompt engineering, customizing, and bringing their expertise of the past uh, into the AI space and do amazing things. Or what if like a PA is tasked with uh, creating the shot list for the day? And, you know, as you know, working in set, there's always changes, there's things happen, people get sick or whatever. There's always something going on. And then you're like, okay, whatever we had at the beginning of the day, now we got to change how we're going to shoot the rest of the day. I mean, do you think it's cheating for like a PA to use AI to help rearrange a shot list or does that not matter? I, no, like what, what's cheating? We're trying to make the day. We're trying to yeah. make you know everybody's job easier. Yep. I, I think that's probably the upside and positive aspects of AI is just making processes that were really arduous before really easy. Mm-hmm. Right, right. And then, you know, on a, a film set, you always have your budgets and you have to like stick to it. And of course, ChatGPT or other tools, they have all this ability to create all sorts of budgets, um, put it even in Excel for you. Copilot is a great example of that. Um, are you guys using Copilot or other things to help even on the, the financial side of video production? I'm sure folks are. I, again, I, I every day I see a new cool use case for how somebody is integrating AI into what they're doing. Yeah. I, I would not be surprised at all. I, I think Microsoft, I don't know if they already have it in office, but they had planned to put AI helpers into everything where you don't need to know equations in Excel. You just ask it, hey, I need you to do X, Y, Z, do the sum of this row, boom, it's done. Sure. Sure. And and then, you know, like in video production, there's a very systematic way of learning cinematography and telling a story, which is why so many people go to school for it, you know, and and there's the art of that. Where do you see where AI is bringing the efficiency to the, the filmmaking process? And where is it where there's that gray area of like, okay, who's creating this content and then who should be compensated for it? You know, where you like who owns what? Yeah, I think it's a it's a murky pond where that's all mixed together. Especially at this point, we're we're what two years into Gen AI, and probably the entirety of the internet has been scraped for all intent purposes. It, you you probably find a model that has all of the best writings, and you know, with the images lie on five B, about six billion images that were scraped from the internet. Uh, I just read recently with Runway, they had scraped a lot of YouTube content, which is why the latest model, the Gen 3, looks so fluid and, and realistic because it's like it's trained on YouTube. So I, I, I think that things are, are kind of all into just a big gumbo of, you know, creativity, content, whatever you want to call it. It's all playing together. So I'm thinking about documentaries right now. Mm. And, you know, I was... While I was listening to you, I was like, okay, I can see in a documentary film that depending on the AI you're using, to, using you could use um, the, the B-roll from different things that happened 100 years ago, 200 years, three years, and scraping from YouTube. Um, but then <clears throat> the, the accuracy, you know, where is what you're seeing accurate? You know, and that's where the... Like, how do you verify what you're seeing is 
really what happened from, you know, the 1800s or 1700s or whatever, whatever time period. I, it's funny you ran up. So I have a feature length documentary I'm going out to New York next week for the premiere. It's called Vida Nueva. A uh, story about a friend of mine's father who got locked up a couple of years ago and just the um, the effect his absence had on the family. Okay. Uh, flew out to DR, interviewed him as he got released from prison, all of the, the siblings. Uh, really wonderful story. I'm, I'm really happy to, to release this out in the world. But we used AI for a number of different uh, areas in the film, and one was B-roll. Um, you know, it's been about two years in production, post-production, maybe a year in post-production for the film, and I'd been wanting AI to get to the place where we could use it for B-roll. You know, we're telling a story that happened two, three decades ago, so there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of moments in the film that no one was there with a camera to tell. Um, but with AI, we were able to recreate some of these scenes, and working with the director was wild. So just for an example, um, part of the story is a blue car in Puerto Rico. So, you know, we prompted that into mid-journey. It's usually the, the pipeline that people that use AI for film use. Like okay. It starts in mid-journey. It's uh, image AI gen. We bring it into a runway to kind of give it a little bit of animation. And, you know, the director, Eliana's like, this is amazing. This looks exactly as I recall it as a child mm. in Puerto Rico. So th there's there's a lot of really cool use cases like that. And th the way that we do it, obviously, we're, we're not trying to trick the audience that this was something that actually happened just with, you know, filters, giving it like a VHS effect. It's clearly, this is something that happened in the past. Um, not unlike um, recreations in documentaries. If right. you were to hire a team to recreate something, I see it as, as using it in that way. So, well, like what it would be the current way that, you know, other people would do to create that, if they wanted that scene, like what would be the pre-AI, how would you do it? There's what a number of different it. ways. Like it could be, you know, animation, hire somebody to draw. It could be claymation where you do it that way. You could hire a team of folks and hair, makeup, wardrobe, location to go off and shoot something to recreate that. And those are all ways that people still and in, into the future and the foreseeable future will, will use to create. So pre-AI, if the director says, hey, I want this type of car and that kind of setting, what do you think like a budget to recreate that? would have been oh, for that one scene yeah just for that one scene uh, i don't know it was a old i mean well you know what does it cost to fly out a crew to puerto rico and find a car and find an old building i don't know i don't know i, I know that the the cost savings are are great you know the way that that we were able to i would think like that, that a shot like that probably costs like Ten to twenty thousand, depending on how you do it. Sure. Yeah, conservatively, right? Yeah, yeah, conservatively. But then, when you guys are using, you know, Mid Journey and Runway, that whole shot sequence. What I what did it cost to build that? Just your own time? Yeah, you know, credits. The the really wild thing with that, um, there were a lot of virtual editing sessions I did with the director. So we're just on Zoom. And that was one of them, just using the, the AI for the B-roll. Like, we're on a Zoom call. And I go into mid-journey and say, okay, you want this little blue car in Puerto Rico? Does this look like, yeah, cool. Let's throw it into runway. Okay, how does this look awesome? And within a couple minutes, we've got a B-roll clip to throw into a movie. Right. And that didn't cost nothing, really. I mean. Sense. Yeah, yeah. Sense. Less than Most, a couple hundred bucks. Yeah. Versus... Ten to twenty thousand bucks yeah. to re recreate that shot. Yeah, and that's where filmmakers have the, the distinct advantage today to really tell a story on a low budget, you know, almost no budget because because of all the tools you can really just be creative and on what you want, and then work with the, the the video production, you know. And that reminds me back in the spring, I saw Tyler Perry was about to uh, break ground on this like $800 million video production. And I know he has this massive studio production already. And, and then he halted it because of AI, because of the, what you saw on Sora, as well as a few other tools. And then the question was, well, do I really need to spend $800 million on this production facility if in a few years it's gonna be obsolete? Um, it's funny that 
you're starting to see that. How, how do you think young, young filmmakers are going to be uh, using this to their advantage? Like what ways is this helpful for people starting out? There's so many. I, I think having a traditional background in the arts is always going to be useful. You need to know what came before you. Um, but the tools to create whatever artwork you do, uh, they're, they're going to be vast with AI. There are going to be things that you can do today that you never would have imagined being able to do yesterday. When I first got started with uh, Mid Journey, like V1, it was a potato. You put in a prompt and it looked like a Jackson Pollock painting. It's just like splattered. Oh, like, interesting. At the time, it was just like, I can see... I can see what this is going to be. This is amazing. Whatever I, I can imagine in my head, I can prompt, there it is on the screen in a fraction of a second or a couple of seconds. This is going to be major. And, you know, every iteration, you know, version two, three, four, five, six, it just got better and better and better. It's like, oh, this is extremely powerful as far as a creative tool. So prompt engineering is really key because it's like how you tell the AI tool what you're looking for determines... The result. It's important, but I know that there are tools to, to help with the prompt engineering. For me, I think having a vision uh, and, and a good, clear idea of where you're going from the outset is important. You can have the sharpest tool in the shed, but if you don't know what to do with it, it doesn't do you any good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how are your prompt skills? <laughs> I don't know. This feels like a man versus machine. I don't want to get crushed. You got me on a show talking about AI, and AI is about to dominate me. And then what? Then what? Then what? Where do we go from here? <laughs> so we we have a little chat GBT has a prompt that we have found that talks about a product launch. Okay. Okay. And we thought it would be interesting to give a live demo of you coming up with a creative idea of a product launch. Of course, we have ChatGPT sitting right across from you, mm -hmm. and she will type it out, and then we will show the audience what it looks like in real time when you use a person of your talent and calibration of creativity and then the tool itself to get to the, the outcome that we're looking for. How are you doing? You ready? I think so. Uh, <laughs> See how fast I can type. <laughs> so the, I have, actually, you know what? I had two different things I was talking about. One was the, the scene and the other one was um, the product demo. Okay. I got the product demo. So we want to create a product launch video to showcase Features or use cases for an initial customer reaction and encouraging people to sign up to receive the sample product. The product is, and this is where you need to describe any product you want, and we're going to enter it in. And then we're asking ChatGPT to map out a script for the voiceover and a shot list for a 30-second video along with suggestions for a music transition and lighting. So, <clears throat> Chris, if you're up for it, what product would you like to demo today. I want to demo an energy drink. I like it. I, I was oh, that's thinking, great. That's yeah. great. Okay, an energy drink, and is this like a coffee energy drink, or are we talking like a Red Bull, or are we talking like, what, are, what, are, what kind of energy drink? We're talking like here? a Red Bull, something high energy. High energy. Heck yeah. B12. Heck do you yeah. want me to put just high energy drink, or do you want me to put like Red Bull? Do we want to put a actual product in there let's maybe stay away from actual product yeah. <laughs> and i always say that because depending on the platform you might run into we can't you know use this this is trademark whatever whatever so yep, yep. let's do high energy high okay. energy drink perfect so chat gpt is thinking right now <laughs> as we speak putting together the output along with again the suggestions for the music the transitions and the lighting Wow, this is pretty amazing. And it's a lot. What we're also going to be doing, if you're watching on YouTube, we're going to put up the results on YouTube so you can see it. And if you're listening to us on Spotify or any of the podcast platforms, um, you're just going to have to listen to Billy read off a little bit to give us a small sample of what that looks like, just so the you know our listening audience it's a good flavor. Sure, sure. All right. Well, the opening is in introducing the product line, the ultimate fuel for your day. Um, it features packed with natural energy, enhanced focus, and long-lasting endurance. 
Uh, let's see, shot list. Dynamic sh action shots would be person opening the can, the drink fizzing, athlete drinking it before running. We've seen that many times. Let's get a little bit more creative here. Um, office worker taking a sip and focusing intently on their screen. Um, and then use cases would be gym scene, outdoor scene, office scene. There's a lot going in here. Okay, the music they want us to do, upbeat electronic track with a strong rhythm, building an energy as the video progresses. And the lighting, bright energetic lighting with sharp contrast during the feature shots, warm and natural lighting for testimonials to keep it relatable and authentic. I like that one. Mm -hmm. All right, so now, you being the professional, and obviously you've done a lot of these product launches, what do you think of that uh, output that response. Do you think, like, out of, let's say one out of five stars? What? How many stars? Five being the most. How many stars would you give that? I give it a three and a half. Three I, and a half. Okay. I, I think that the reason it sounds so good is because it's so generic, and we yeah. see a lot of those commercials, and that's kind of what AI has been trained on is a lot of folks doing the same thing. So it. it mirrors back what we've fed in doing garbage sure. in garbage out yeah and i was thinking would, i was gonna give it like a two and a half <laughs> i i was not that impressed i didn't think there was any creativity to that i think that if uh i was gonna go back to the table i would go back to chat gpt add a, lo a lot more detail to what i would like it to do and then start seeing how it could expand off of my ideas um, and granted, we didn't give it any shot locations or any, any details whatsoever, but I thought that was a kind of a generic, which is a great representation of what you were saying, where they scrape the internet, they kind of get a basic gist of what's going on for different things, and they come up with you know, generic responses. I, I would say that's just a mid-average. The, the cool thing with having that as a baseline is, as you said, your own personal experience, being able to customize that. We could have made that any one of those stories or, mm -hmm. you know, maybe we go into the story of the guy in the office and dig a little bit deeper into that and what's going on where he needs to have this energy drink. And I, I, I think having that as a baseline uh, as far as an actual tool is, is useful. Just kind of the, the, it solves the white paper issue of you're, you're in front of a white piece of paper or whiteboard and we need to have an idea. Sure. You know, what are we mm -hmm. gonna do? Where are we gonna start? But you know and I know that it's really important to tell a story with some emotional connection. Absolutely. And so what I felt where that response was lacking is the emotional connection. So in my head, if you're gonna sell an energy drink, you better talk about um, somebody who's really tired. You know, and I always think of like new fathers <laughs> or moms, new moms or dads, new parents. Like it is exhausting to have a baby mm -hmm. in the house. Mm -hmm. And so you're like sitting down, guys on the couch, just exhausted, just got the kid down. And now he's got to go out and do all the yard work or you got to go, you know, clean the house or whatever it is got to go on. Maybe the house is a huge mess. You take a shot of uh, your, your, your great drink that you just suggested. <laughs> that's how healthy and organic and great for you and no, no sugar, low sugar. And, and then boom, you know, the house is looking spick and span. And before you know it, you got two hours left to finish the rest of your day. But that, that's how, that's the emotional connection. And that's a whatever, and that you, that I feel like that's somebody who has a lot of years of experience in storytelling would tell a better story <laughs> than just kind of like what you said, just scraping the internet, giving it the, the middle of the road, you know? And that's where um, I hope, because AI doesn't make us more lazy on creativity. What, what are your thoughts on that? I think we're gonna see, as we do now, it's gonna run the gamut of, there's a lot of crap out there from folks that, you know, don't have the experience, the time, the budget, the whatever, the bandwidth to, to really tell a good story, or create a good ad, and it'll scale all the way to folks that have those resources and experience that can make amazing things. I don't think it fundamentally changes, you know, human behavior. It, it just makes no. things faster, easier, cheaper, whatever. Yeah, mm -hmm. in some instances. Mm -hmm. But isn't it in like video production, just like the business always has been about great storytelling, and that just comes from talented people. Yeah, I mean that's that's what we're you know hopefully working towards, and for many reasons we fall short of grace, but <laughs> that's, that's the pinnacle <laughs> that we're trying to get to, right? It's telling compelling stories that resonate with people and are, are sticky. So when you're 
submitting your film to what's the film festival? So the film festival is the New York Latino Film Fest. The New York Latino Film Fest. And do they require you to disclose if you've used AI in any of the production parts or, or is that not a thing right now? Uh, you know, I didn't handle the submission process, so okay. I, I'm not sure, but my hope is that, you know, if there's a panel or an after party, we'll, we'll be able to talk about all of the tools that we used in creating it. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, where I'm going with this is then like anybody else who submitted a film, mm. would you want to know how much somebody else used AI or not? Like how much are they cutting on production costs to use tools or or does that even matter i don't know because in storytelling you know i could see the argument either way and i'm just kind of curious what your thought i mean you're in the industry uh, personally i just i want to see good stories that make me want to feel and think and do um, however people you know create those stories whatever tools they use it, it doesn't really matter I, I don't think people know half the time what tools folks don't know what camera or what lens right. or and take it back to painters. I don't know what type of paintbrush Picasso used for anything. It's just there's a piece of art is resonant. That's what matters. Got it. Mm -hmm. Got it. Welcome back. Thank you very much for taking that break with us. I hope everybody had a chance to get up, refill their coffee, and enjoy the second half of our show of Ask Clever Over Coffee, How AI Built This. Again, we are in studio with Chris McDuffie, and we are talking all things AI in video production. And we have another segment for you. I love the first half where we, 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 we were pitching a product and seeing what it would do and then <laughs> rating it like American Idol or something. We're like, <laughs> okay, well, what did we think of the response? No offense, you know, Billy, it wasn't you, it was just ChatGPT. But uh, we're gonna do it again. And this time, what I think the audience would like to see or hear about is using it um, to storyboard, because like you said, oftentimes coming up with ideas, you have the blank stare, you're like at the white piece of paper and you're like, okay, I have to create something. <laughs> and you just need a starting point and then you keep modifying it from there. And I would like to see uh, us recreate and talk about a, an iconic scene from a movie that you love, and then we'll put it in the chat GBT and we'll see what ChatGPT the response is, and then we'll grade it and see, do we like the response, or does this still got a long ways to go on AI? And I think for the people watching on YouTube or listening on Spotify or other platforms, is really, you get to see in real time, hey, what are the results of ChatGPT? Like, do you like it? I know that you in the, the professional world are using MidJourney, and 11 labs and a few other tools i've used different tools but let's just kind of like say that chat gpt is kind of the, the baseline for ai and then you know what i mean obviously there are other tools that you're going to get much different responses on so with that said let me give you guys at home the uh prompt and then you're going to fill it in with the movie scene so it says use dolly and that's the image generator that as uh, OpenAI uses to transform the descriptive text from iconic movie scenes into visual storyboards, emphasizing the interplay between dialogue and imagery that creates a bridge between the screenplay and film. So what would be an iconic movie scene that you would like to see ChatGPT do in a storyboard? I'd say Dark Knight, a semi truck gets uh, clotheslined and does a flip in the air. That was, that was pretty epic. So Dark Knight, I'm going to put that in parentheses. I'm trying to be the prompt engineer here. That's right. And then say the last part of Dark Knight. Uh, a semi gets clotheslined in a street and does a flip in the air. Okay. And so what we're looking for, the result will be, is will ChatGPT create an image of the storyboard? And in all full disclosure, we did test this out ahead of time before the show, and it was interesting to see different results from different movie scenes. And so we're gonna see, is there any content uh, licensing issues or what will ChatGPT say to us? All right, it's thinking. 
So now that it's thinking. Dun, dun. <laughs> so how are they going to see it? Are we going to put that? We on? would put it up on the screen if it does generate an image. Is it generating it's, an image? It's, ge it's getting there. Um, the image doesn't come up yet. Here is the visual storyboard inspired by the iconic scene oh, from The Dark Knight, focusing on the semi-truck flipping into the street. Um, now you yes. got to show so, Chris. OK. you got to turn your computer around yep. and just like show him. And we'll put this on, on the screen for everybody watching, as well as Chris, why don't you describe what, what ChatGPT is so people who are listening? Yeah, so we're seeing an illustration of the scene with the semi flipping into the air. Um, I, I like the, the artwork. That's really cool. I love the illustration. I don't know how accurate it got the, the semi getting clothesline and flipping in the air. There are some scenes with people flipping the air. <laughs> there's, there's one. I've got, we got a lower left quadrant uh, with the semi flying through the air. That's pretty cool. Um, Can you read the words on it? It looked a little blurry. Yeah, the, it's that AI uh, text. The word sapping taut. <laughs> the word blur just just before flipping. The truck eimed <laughs> he air. Okay. Yeah, the AI speak, the alien AI speak. <laughs> yeah. So All right, we you, need to work on that one. Would you say, well, well, first, out of five stars, what would you rate that response? Uh, in, in realistic for video production for like, what you guys would do. I mean, if it was a storyboard, I think that would work just fine. It as would. As far as how closely it, it matched the actual scene that I'm thinking of, maybe not so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how many stars? What are we giving? I'm, I'll give it a two star. Okay. Mm -hmm. two, give it a two star. Two star. Two star. We, we, didn't quite, we didn't quite nail it. Now, if, yeah. the, if this was actually something that I was trying to, to dial in, I'd, I'd run it. I mean, projects that I've done, I've, you know, ran it hundreds of times to like get that one. But that's just the creative in me that's very particular and... It's not just using the first prompt or the first image get, that gets spit out. Mm -hmm. like, I want to see something that gets as close to what I'm imagining as possible. So that, that, that brings up a good uh, point. So when you are going through the creative process and you're putting together storyboards, how many different versions and ideas do you? What, like, what's the standard? It depends. Okay. It all depends. Sometimes the first prompt can nail it and it's like, cool, that's it. Let's move on. Sometimes it's like, I am 250 deep as far as trying to get it to exactly where I want it to be in different prompts and prompt engineering and still is not there. I might have to bring it into Photoshop and comp in other stuff um, because I've got all of these other you know skill sets that I'll go in the weeds. But I, it really all depends on the project and, and how particular I'm, I'm trying to be with it. Okay. Okay. So you gave this, what, two stars? I'll, I'll give it a two star. Out of five. And you would most likely probably rework your prompt engineering one or two more times to get kind of closer to the ballpark of recreating that scene. So that would be a, a better representation of the storyboard itself. Yeah, there's a few different ways. So it can be just, <clears throat> excuse me, re-rolling the prompt. And okay. So with that, you know, if that works, it might be a, you know, a dozen times I might do that. It might be reworking the prompt itself. See right. If that works. I, I don't know. There's a few different ways to tackle that. Sure. Yeah. I know when I've been working with the image generator, they have a tool on there, and you click on it, and then you basically point out where on the image that you want it to change. And then there's like a side prompt and you could go in there and instead of saying one of those crazy little words, you know, that don't even make sense. And you say, wow, or zap or whatever, change it to this. And then I'll recreate the image and use your specific instruction to edit just that piece of it. Um, and I, I feel like that's coming along pretty well overall. Now, when I look at the storyboard, I would give that a three and a half out of five because I felt like that did better than let's say I thought it would do. <laughs> I, I didn't even know like based off of the dark night if it would even generate it, you know, um, but it, it did work. And for me as a basic filmmaker or a basic person, like a very entry level skill set here, I thought that was a pretty good representation of just putting something where you would put it on a storyboard within a, a larger story just to kind of capture what you want the story to entail, not necessarily, of course, the specifics of that scene. Yeah, I, I, there was nothing wrong with any one of those. I, I think that brings up a good point that because it's so easy to create now with AI, 
I personally am going to go into the weeds to make sure that if it is a storyboard or image or whatever, it gets as close to what I'm imagining as possible because it's cheap, fast, easy to just keep re-rolling and re-prompting. Right, right. And then what type of products, I mean projects or films or commercials where you would be using AI more and then what type of projects would you use it less? Like I have an idea, but I was kind of curious like, how you would answer that? It depends. So, uh, you know, as as a small production company, if it's a project where I'm handling more, you know, with fewer people, I'm probably going to use a lot of AI to kind of supplement just having a small team as just another really smart resource. If I'm getting brought in as a DP or a photographer on a project, probably not so much because there's other skill sets that probably, you know, outdo a lot of the AI at this point. Yeah. Yeah. And... You know, going back to what we were talking about before, the uh, the artists or the people in front of the camera, and when they have concerns about a studio or, you know, because basically whoever's paying for it owns it, and they own the rights indefinitely because they own the rights to the film, then they also, anything that goes into the production of it, if they want to spin off and, you know, the technology in, in life is just changing. Like I, I'm thinking back to like NFTs. So let's say I, I created this film and then all of a sudden NFTs are blown up again and I want to create a trading card of all the characters from my film. And then I have little voice snippets and maybe I want to modify a catchy phrase or just talk about like if I had a, a mother and son character and I wanted the mother to say something different that wasn't necessarily in the film, but maybe captured what I was trying to say that I would use that actress's voice to recreate it. And I know if that took off and sold really well, then, you know, the actress would be like, Hey, I'm not seeing <laughs> that. So it's kind of interesting or, you know, like all sorts of spinoff projects if it like ended up in a video game or anything else. I mean, there's so many ways that these, these, actors have to protect themselves and it's almost like what happened back in the day when there was this transition between using union and non-union actors and now you have like how the digital divide of ai and non-ai actors you know and how do you protect the talent that's, that's a tough question. I, I don't think it gets answered anytime soon. Uh, I'll do you one better. I think Eleven Labs just signed with all the estates of a lot of uh, dead celebrities. Sorry. Uh, so Eleven Labs just signed uh, with the estates of a lot of dead celebrities to license their voices, mm. which is kind of wild to think that, you know, it, it's been done before in commercials and mm -hmm. these ways, but, you know, to bring back these folks that have been dead for however long. Kind of well, it seems like Elvis will never die. Yeah. <laughs> really? I mean, really? Tupac either. <laughs> there you go. Tupac Absolutely. will never die. Absolutely. The Beatles keep living on. Michael yeah. Jackson. I, I mean, those are the top four yeah. of, um, of people who were previously with us. And then their estates just keep living and they keep licensing out in so many different ways that I'm sure... You know, they would the actor or the entertainer would be just blown away. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But, uh, like I know Elvis I could never imagine him being re recreated in so many different formats mm -hmm. yeah. as he is now, and that does make sense. And I don't think, for me, you know, just like logically thinking here about like let's say let's take for example Elvis, uh, the, his estate wants to license out um, his likeness in all these different AI scenarios. I wouldn't think as long as like, you know, you, um, you weren't having Elvis, you know, use a firearm or something to that effect where it would just be completely contradictory to his character and image, then, you know, it wouldn't be necessarily um, something that an estate wouldn't lo look at, you know, if using and doing. You know? And you, I think that probably could extend to actors, actresses that are alive, where we might get to a place where you just license your voice or your likeness for whatever product company and generate income that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then I'm thinking about what about um, some of the, like, the Disney characters that are pretty close to the end of uh, copyright protection, and then... Let's say, for example, like Winnie the Pooh. 
you have Winnie the Pooh and you could just get somebody else that sounds like Winnie the Pooh. Um, you don't need the exact voice and you could take that character, throw that into AI and because now it's copyright free, you know, you could make it say or do anything. You know? I mean, yes, yes. And I think there was a company that did a horror movie with Winnie the Pooh. Oh, so we didn't have to do AI. It's just like if the IP is up for grabs, anybody can use it to do whatever. So you could bring back, you know, like uh, Da Vinci or any of the great artists um, from the last thousand years and recreate these people and in their works into a whole storyline and what's stopping that, you know? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I think we're, we're seeing some really interesting use cases to that front of things that never were, were able to be realized before. So what, what are some, um, you know, this, uh, this podcast is really about challenging the fears. What are some fears of like, what should filmmakers quote unquote, um, be weary of using AI in the future? Gosh, I, I, that's a big question. I, I don't know. I don't know that anybody can see that far in the future. And with how fast AI is moving, it's almost impossible to, to predict what, what threats we should be looking out for. Do you think that filmmakers are apprehensive right now of using it? Or do you think they're opening their arms and saying, yeah, let's, let's, let's push to the threshold of this? Like, what, what's been the feedback of the your colleagues and professionals that are... It, it's across the board. It is. There are folks that are never AI, that will never touch it. Really? They're traditionalist and, you know, more power to them. I think that's awesome to, to be able to create in a way that you've always created and really own that. There are a lot of folks that are saying, this is a cool new tool that's going to allow me to do X, Y, Z, you know, in these time constraints with this budget. And before, this never would have been an option, but now we can, we can actually make this happen. Yeah, I was wondering, I mean, does this help bring down the cost of production for, you know, either feature films or anything. I mean, it depends. I mean, you know, at, at, at that level of big features, a lot of those costs are kind of, they're, they're built in, you know, it, that's, that's why it's a whole industry. Mm -hmm. I, I'm personally really excited more at the indie level of smaller creators that have fewer resources that are able to add a lot of production value to what they're doing. Got it. Got it. And that, that does make sense, right? Because, those are the people that it's helping the most is the people who are on a tight budget, but yet extremely creative and trying to come up with different ways to tell a story. Yeah, absolutely. All right. I have a, a two part question here. So the first one, what would be your dream project that you could do? And then the second one would be, do you have one that comes to mind that's the most challenging project that you've ever done and why? Ooh, good questions. Um, a dream project. I'm trying to find ways to tap into child me via AI. So I used to do a lot of like stop motion animation and claymation. Mm -hmm. uh, I think my sister filmed over a lot of those old DV tapes with dancing videos oh, <laughs> before there was oh, TikTok. Shit. I was going to ask you, do you have something that we could play for the audience? Nope. <laughs> nope. I do not. But, you know, I, I think getting back to that freedom that has a kid just to create without there being a lot of restrictions. That's what I'm always trying to get back to. I think that's what a lot of creators are trying to get back to before it was a job and all these other responsibilities. Like I just want to make something that I love and I would watch and I would consume and I would share with my friends. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we'll see. There, there are ways I'm, I'm trying to use AI for cheap VFX and, um, you know, again, stop motion or claymation or animation trying to find ways to, to use AI to make fun stuff for me. All right, so do you have an example of your work that you could uh, send us and we could incorporate into the show? Yeah, I've got a whole uh, Instagram account that's just AI oh, that's projects cool. that I've been messing around with. So. Oh, really? Yes. All right, so if you're watching on YouTube, we're going to put up two different examples. You'll have to tell us which ones you want us, and you guys get to see it. And then if you're listening on Spotify or the other platforms, Definitely go to our YouTube channel, Ask Clever Over a Coffee, and you're going to want to watch this and make sure that you can see. And I would really be curious when you watch in the comments section below, if you let us know, do you really think that's AI or do you think he could have shot that in real life as well? Because that's the whole point, right? Is, is this AI or is this not? Sure, absolutely. <clears throat> and then what would be, or do you have a project that was 
most challenging that comes to mind? Uh, n- not without outing any potential clients <laughs> yeah. or operators. So maybe I'll speak higher, high level. Yes. Yep. Sure. There's, there's always challenges on every production. Um, I, I think it's more often than not a human resource issue mm-hmm. than something technical. Okay. Interesting. So what's the like most overrated, um, video trends that you're seeing right now in the industry? I think that anything that's that's overdone is just it, it gets played out. It's cliche. I've seen a lot of cool FPV drone stuff, which I love. I've seen a lot of robot arm stuff, which I love. I've seen a lot of cool transitions, which I love. I've seen a lot of fly throughs, which I love. I I think that it's really how you do it and bringing a different voice to it that that makes it interesting. Now, what's one thing that you would never automate in video production? I don't know if there's anything specific. I, I think it's just more project based and what makes sense for the project. You know, it could be any aspect that given the time constraints, we need to automate this. The feature film that I'm doing, uh, we, the director had a little bit of VO and she's a voice actress. When I first sent her the sample, she's like, this is scary because some of my income is voice acting. This sounds exactly like me. Um, she later went back and re-recorded some of it, but like for the little bit of time that we were editing it, like we needed her voice and she's got a full-time job. It didn't make sense to have her go into the studio and record us. I said, just send me three samples of your voice. We'll throw it in 11 labs just as a placeholder until you can come back and re-record this. But it, it's really for me, I think it's project dependent on what aspect is going to be AI or automated or whatever. So... And this brings me back to earlier in our conversation. Like, I think the part of the process that you would never automate is the creative process. Like, yeah, you can use the tool to maybe help you explain what your your idea of what you're thinking. But you like, if you want to put together a shot list, um, or the director of photography, you know, the DP, they always have certain ideas of how they want it to look and the filters and the angles. I mean, how would AI replace that? I don't know so much of replacement, but supplementing it. So we talked about using ChatGPT to solve for, you know, the whiteboard issue. Right. That carries throughout. If I didn't have an idea of how to tackle a specific shot, I could go to Shot Deck and look at, you know, millions of images from past films and find just the right one that fits, you know, what fits the project. Ah. I could go into another AI app and say, this is kind of what I'm thinking. Show me some options and do some prompt engineering, massaging, and work way through it that way. Right, right. But to my point, to what I'm trying to say is that you still have a specific idea because you're the creator and you know like really the vision of what you're trying to do. And so therefore, I mean, you, you, you can't automate the creativity in overall. You can supplement, I like that word a lot. You can supplement the process, but at the end of the day, the talent is in the vision, you know, and then and then the ability to pull together all the different elements in order to make it work. And I see that, you know, when we're creating ads, um, whether they're, you know, TV or they're gonna be shown in a convention or in a mall or, you know, on the airplane or wherever, or social media, you still have to have the vision. You still have to understand what's gonna connect with an audience on the script writing. Yeah. Hey, I might have written you a sample script, but you have to edit it. And you still have to look at, you know, AI doesn't know everything about a product or doesn't know all the, all the things. So it's only as good as you tell it to do. I agree with that. Um, I think that, like we're saying, with AI supplementing what you do, there's a lot of everything that you just said that could be AI assisted. So I've seen campaigns that people have prompt engineer with chat GPT to mm-hmm. do market research, to figure out if sure. you need to place this here, what does the market look like? How is this going to play with this audience? Uh, I don't know that there's so much a, a differentiation differentiation of like man versus machine. I, th- I think they, they kind of come together. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a, that's a good point because it, uh, they do come together. There isn't man versus machine. And this is where, you know, we're constantly telling people to, you know, learn AI, 
try it out. Many people who are watching or listening have never used AI or never even used ChatGPT. You know, you got to see Chris and myself talk to uh, ChatGPT today, do a prompt, you get to see the results. You can see how easy it is to kind of get started on different ideas and, uh, you know, that's helpful. And that's where a lot of people who are afraid of it just need to try it. Like how many people have you heard, hey, that might replace my job and they've never even used <laughs> ChatGPT or any other AI tool, Copilot or anything like uh, like that. Now, I know there's, a, there's one part of uh, your industry that there are already laws about, which is the deep fakes and taking celebrities and different people and then using it either for, you know, prank calls, prank videos or, or anything like that, you know, and the laws have always been around satire and what that is. And that's always been a fine line. But then now with AI, I mean, you can make uh, political leaders say anything. You could take like Elon Musk, have him say anything you want because there's plenty of audio clips for an AI to recreate that voice and then and then make it say whatever. Um, what have you heard from people that you're working with about the deep fakes? Um, has that been an issue or what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think that's that's always an issue that, you know, with enough training, somebody can make you say or do anything that they want you to. I think beyond that, my big concern is the stat that I've, I've come across in a number of different places is that, you know, 50% of social media, certainly, but the internet is just bots. I'm concerned about not being real people on the internet and folks interfacing and talking to and reacting to or whatever, people that just are not real at all. I, I think that's much more of a threat than people having your likeness. That, that'll always be a threat on an individual level. But I think on a much bigger level, just you know, having AI, everything, people, you know, social media influencers, fake whatever. I think that's well. Yeah, you know, you see that and hear about that. You know, on Twitter slash X. Um, I have actually seen a lot more bots and activity on LinkedIn, mm. where it just seems like more automated messages and more automated communications, which is kind of interesting since it's supposed to be a professional world, yeah. but the bots are creeping in there, um, specifically even bots to like find you a job, uh, apply for a job. And then you see, uh, I've seen more bots also on WhatsApp and uh, Facebook Messenger. And I think that's because uh, to create a bot, that's such a low barrier. It's not terribly difficult to even create one. Yeah. Um, and that's where it leads to a lot of miscommunication in, in the public. But if, if you're a filmmaker and you're out there and you want to promote a film and you want to like talk about it or talk about different elements, I mean, w could you see yourself working with you, the marketing team of a, of a film and trying to use a bot just to like capture the, a couple of characters and, and put them out there <laughs> into the ether? I would have to assume that folks are, are already doing already that. doing that. Yeah, absolutely. So if like, um, you had somebody from one of your films and maybe put it on Reddit, you could literally have a bot to do communications or DMs or comments and responding. I mean, in a, in a not dystopian way, I think that could be really cool. That's a cool way to have engagement. If you've got a, a film and a bunch of characters, and yeah. you put a bot and they can talk about the film and other things in their backstory, their life. I, I think, you know, there's some cool potential use cases. Yeah. There. yeah. But like anything, whenever you're using a bot, there's always the risk of any bias that might come out or training the bot to do something nefarious, um, to say something that that character or that would never be legit, or even like we were working uh, with an image generator on Chat Chat GBT, but there's plenty of examples um, of when you've used an AI and it's come back historically inaccurate. So how how do you protect that and like like you know, especially when you're talking about history and you're talking about documentaries of the past, you got to keep some sort of historical standard. I mean, does that exist right now? Even uh, minus uh, AI, just does it exist that there's a, like a historical standard? 
There is, and I think it'll get really difficult moving forward. Um, there are a lot of off-the-shelf AI platforms, and you know the developers and programs have a lot of guardrails so that people hopefully aren't using them in certain ways they don't want them to. But you know, if you've got stuff like Stable Diffusion, where you could download that on your own computer and do your own training and create whatever images you want with no guardrails. Or Wait, what is that? So uh, Stable Diffusion. So it. it's a, it's another AI program. It usually requires kind of you know hefty uh, hefty PC to run. Okay. Uh, but you can train your own images. You can do your own scraping. You can train your own images. Um, and you can output whatever you want to. No guardrails. Well, what would be an example of using that f for good and then? N not so much. N not so good. You can use your imagination of all the horrible, you know, ways you can use that. But I've for seen like adult content or firearms, sure, stuff like all sure, that sure. stuff. Yeah, um, there are a lot of groups that I follow. I've seen people train their own image, so put in twenty selfies, and then you can insert yourself into whatever type of scenario. It's photorealistic if you're going to use that for any type of advertising or whatever. That, that's a cool use case. So I could see, like, because I come from the advertising background, like if I uh, was working with a client and they, I said, well, you know, we're putting a storyboard together and they said, oh, I would like to use, you know, such and such actor. I'd just say Jennifer Aniston just for, mm. for an example. And then you use that and you get like, okay, uh, use this Jennifer Aniston. You got lots of different looks. And then you just modify it slightly because I'm sure you can modify the, the image a little bit. And then you get a, a like sound, sounding Jennifer Aniston voice, not not her voice, but somebody who sounds like her. I mean, that's where the gray area comes into play. Yeah, I, that's back to just bots and AI fakery and things not being real and yeah. not real people and not real profiles and all of the, the scammers. The, the one that I've heard a number of times is a parent will get a phone call from their kids saying, hey, mom, they've got me. We need you to send the ransom money. A parent tries to call the kid. They can't get a hold of them because they're using some type of AI voice that sounds exactly like the kid. Mm -hmm. hey, there's a lot of those scary you know, scams and, and nefarious use cases that are happening in real time. And I could see that even being used against seniors because seniors are the most vulnerable part um, because they, they're just generally very trusting. And so if you call them and with that scenario and they they just don't have the tools to like really question if this is real and they'll respond accordingly and then just get scammed. That's the thing with AI. It, it's getting that good where it's very conversational and you mm -hmm. can carry on a whole conversation and not know if it's a real human or not. Right. And I know that in our company, we've been working with AI voice now for the last four or five months, been learning a lot with it and it's getting faster and faster for us to turn around different things. And one thing I've been thoroughly impressed, you know, to what your point is that you can give it very little direction on um, the voice tenor, uh, um, the wittiness, or whether you want it to be more professional or more casual conversation. And it really does an outstanding job about, about you know, making it sound realistic. I was, oh, I, every time I use it, I'm blown away by how good it is. I'm like, wow, that is, above and beyond because it's so thorough, it's so natural sounding. Absolutely. Um, and that's where you do get a little weary when it's when you're talking about video production in the nefarious way where you could take your school principal or a parent or anything and, and plug it for not so good things. And no, that's been in the headlines. Mm -hmm. There was a school recently where someone used AI to, to set up a coworker that they had a grudge with and got them fired. And it was this whole scandal. I mean, it, the, the, it's like whatever you can imagine using AI for, it's, it's already happening. Right, yeah. right. And that's where it's going to be hard for all of us to filter what's real and what's not. To your point um, is like there's a lot more bots and we want to make sure we're actually talking to humans and the humans are engaging, and how do you limit that? Yeah, when I was in college, there was a lot of conversation around media literacy and just making sure that the public was literate and how they can you know, process the news that they're getting. Now it's like AI literacy. How do you trust anything that you see or hear or consume? And what, what do you think is a good way to improve AI literacy? 
I, I mean, everyone putting hands on it, you know, take a tool, chat GBT, mid journey, 11 labs, whatever, just understand the things that you can do with these tools and be a little bit more discerning about whatever content that you're, you're putting into your mind. Got it. So what has been the biggest challenge that you've had by incorporating? So you said you've been using AI for like last six months or so. What has been the biggest challenge or hurdle? in learning AI and using it for you and your work? I, for me, it's just I, I, I've got a really laser vision that I'm trying to go for, getting the AI to align with where I'm trying to be. Again, I've, I've done projects where it's been hundreds of re-rolls to get just that perfect image or that perfect little video clip or that voice. Um, I think that there's still a lack of control as far as AI and kind of once that hurdle is overcome you know, the sky is going to be the limit as far as what we'll see created. Hmm. Okay. Well, what advice would you give to video producers that are hesitant about using AI? You know, you talked about some of the people, uh, colleagues and different professionals that you've worked with that really want to stick to how they've always been doing it. What, what advice would you give them? about uh, using AI or do you think you just leave them alone? <laughs> I, you know, it, everybody's got to find their own way. I, I, when I got started messing around with Gen AI, it, it wasn't to supplant or replace anything. I was just, I wanted to have a sense of what is this thing that everybody's, you know, raving and ranting about. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, let's pull it, let's stretch it, you know, stretch, test it. Let's figure out how it can be used in, yep. in various ways and go from there. Got it. Got it. All right. Well, um, we're about to wrap up here, but I wanted to make sure that we cover and plug anything that you're working on uh, and also invite if you want to use or uh, uh, give us a clip of like how you used AI in, in the, the film that you're submitting, you know, would love to include that for the audience just to see. Um, some of the, uh, some of your work, but if, is there anything else that you would like to plug or uh, share with the audience? I can find me all over the interwebs, Chris McDuffie, usually McDuff photo is the, is the moniker, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, <laughs> info at Chris McDuffie dot photography. If you have any inquiries, there you go. Yeah. And we'll make sure to include that. So, uh, if you're listening or watching, you could find us all on uh, our YouTube channel, Ask Clever Over Coffee, in there, in the description, we will have all the information about how to connect with uh, Chris and make sure you guys are plugged in. Also, if, uh, any filmmakers or upcoming filmmakers that have more questions specifically, they can always uh, reach out to him on Instagram and just DM him or LinkedIn and DM him that way. So uh, I have in the... Uh, Fast Five wrap up, a reflective segment where uh, me and you uh, talk about um, uh, anything that you want to uh, kind of give as last words about using AI and um, some departing advice for those who are watching and listening. Yeah, I, I, I feel the same way now about Gen AI as I did two years ago. I'm, I'm split 50-50. You know, there are a lot of aspects that are completely terrifying and scary. and We should be very wary in how we move forward and use it. There's a lot of amazing use cases and, you know, ways that it can transform society for the better. Yeah. And I, I feel like the, one of the biggest purposes of the podcast when, when I started this was just to educate people on the fear of using AI. And one of the things I think is a takeaway from this episode and watching on this show specifically is that here the two of us came up with a prompt. We worked with ChatGPT. She uh, gave us, uh, what would we rate it? Two and a half to three and a half, you know, <laughs> response out of five. But it shows in demos to everybody watching and listening that, I mean, it's AI is not going to replace the creative process in what you do. It'll make some parts more efficient. Some parts not. Maybe you could say it is even a uh, lowers the barrier of entry of quality work for people who are just starting. Um, gives you a good baseline to compete against some people who have bigger budgets and can just do more. 
Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean people are going to get replaced or anything like that. It just kind of shuffling the talent pool around. And I think we would both agree that learning to use AI is a good skill to have going into whatever industry you're going in, but specifically even video production, because it's not going anywhere. Absolutely. I agree wholeheartedly. Great. Well, yes, ChatGPT has. Yes, I have. Um, so ChatGPT has been doing some LinkedIn stalking. And I know, John, you like to end the um, the video with oh, the video. Let's edit this part out. The show. Yes. So, OK. So ChatGPT did some LinkedIn stalking. And we know that you like to end the show with something out of kindness. So as far as going into LinkedIn, I uh, reviewed both of your um, profiles and I asked them to give me five positive words. So for Chris, your five positive words out of the LinkedIn is innovative, versatile, inquisitive, visionary, and tech savvy. Ooh, oh, I Chat like GPT. that. Yeah, I'm right? Fire. Pretty nice. I'll tell you. And then for John, it's innovative, strategic, client-focused, forward-thinking, and results-driven. Wow. I think that's the first time on a show we've ever been reviewed by uh, ChatGPT. <laughs> nice. I'll tell you. All right. I'll give that ChatGPT five stars. Five, you give five, five out of five. Five, <laughs> five out of five. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been reviewed uh, by ChatGPT, so that was cool. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for coming in today, talking to us about uh, well, the important parts of what's going on using AI and video production. And we hope to have you back many times over. And maybe the next time we'll bring in somebody who absolutely hates AI. And we could have a very nice debate <laughs> about somebody using AI versus somebody not. And where is the middle ground for that? Because that would be another great show to have. Um, because I think there's a lot of resistance to the technology and let's say in the next six months to 12 months, a lot is going to change in your industry and just in life in general. And one of the, the news, news that just came out is Apple is coming out with an AI generative for their iPhone. And I believe we're going to have to do a whole show just on that, of what the implications are going to be on that alone. So stay tuned for upcoming shows. Again, follow us on YouTube, on TikTok, on Instagram, on Facebook, and at LinkedIn. Thank you for tuning in today, and we'll see you on the other side.